What's up, everybody? Lou with Hypocritic back on the show floor at PAX East 2022. We are here with Becca, co-founder and CEO of Finji, to talk about some of the games they're showing here on the show floor. Thanks so much for taking some time this afternoon. So I want to start with Tunic. It has kind of the most booth attention uh, here at the show, and, and I know it was recently released. Uh, in your own words, what is Tunic? Uh, okay, so Tunic is an action-adventure game. You play as a small fox who washes up on the shore of a very big world, um, and you are sort of exploring the space. You are fighting very cute and sometimes less cute monsters, um, and you are discovering secrets. The whole world of Tunic is just like layered with a lot of secrets, and probably some of your viewers are sitting there like nodding, being like, yes, 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 I found that first ending, and oh my god, I found the second one too. So yeah, it's uh, we launched it about five and a half weeks ago, and the um, sort of support in the player base has just been incredible. That's That's been fantastic. The Most of the development, I think, was, was just done by one person, uh, if I recall. Uh, what was the process like finding the game from an origin like that, where it's basically a one-person development team for most of its life and, and bringing it out into the market? Yeah, so Tunic's actually kind of interesting. So it started out as one person and ended up with quite a few people working on it. So um, the lead creator, his name is Andrew Schuldice, and he um, lives up in Halifax. And back in like 2015, 2016, he actually approached my husband and I at GDC um, and was like, hey, I've got this cool thing I want to show you. And we were late for something and totally brushed him off and like disappeared. And a mutual friend was like, you know, you really should email Beck and Adam because they do want to talk to you. Um, that actually started our mentorship relationship. So we were a publisher then, but we also in the industry have mentored many indie teams over the years. So um, we started mentoring Andrew. Um, that went on for a couple of years and in 2017 or 2018, 2017 actually, um, we were at a, an event again, and we were sort of talking to him about development and our normal mentorship check-in. And it was very obvious that the game felt like it was getting much too big. He was very, like, he wasn't completely alone, but it was just um, Andrew, his producer, Felix. Um, sound was Kevin uh, Regami and also Terrence um, on music. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, it, we realized that he needed sort of an extra designer to sort of be nearby for him to bounce ideas off of. and more often than like the every two month check-in that we had been doing. Um, and we pitched to him like, hey, do you want us to publish it? If we do this, you'll have basically whatever access you need to Adam, who is the creative director at Finji, who can just sit here and like help hash out and help hold this huge game that you're making. Um, and yeah, so that's, most of our projects have actually started out as mentorships first in some way. Um, we wanna make sure that the teams that we work with value our expertise um, because we're an independent developer first, not a publisher first. We make our own games, we have our own internal IP. Um, and we slot in our publishing projects between our own uh, like sort of internal uh, games that we launch. That's fantastic. Now, kind of on that idea of mentorship, do you find that to be helpful in terms of, of sort of shaping their abilities and sort of crafting projects? And how, how, do you, how have you found that over time to be a useful approach? Uh, it's actually just like baseline of the way Adam and I operate in the industry. We figure if we make all the mistakes for other people, they won't have to make them. And when, especially with Adam, his passion is making games. It's all he's ever wanted to do. And if he can spend, we refer to it as like our one life, our one creative life, to influence, um, influence and help other game developers make beautiful things, like that's time well spent. Um, so we always make time for mentorship relationships. Sometimes it's a one-off things. Um, sometimes it's uh, like, for example, the NYU, um, Game Center program, we are just summer mentors for their incubator. Um, we also have been mentors on um, Train Jam, which is a really cool thing that everyone should look up. Um, it would take me too long to explain it. But I don't know, when you have expertise, when you have the ability to sort of bring up other developers and other creatives, like, I don't know, why not? Like, what a cool way to spend a life um, and a creative life. So, yeah. That's fantastic. And now speaking of, you know, Beautiful works, uh, bringing them into the marketplace. Uh, your newest title, not out yet. I was a teenage exocolonist. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I was a teenage exocolonist is actually, um, it is a game designed by uh, a woman named Sarah Northway. Sarah Northway is actually up in Vancouver. Um, and she made the Rebuild series. So like, I believe there's three of those. Um, there might only be two, but I think there's three. Um, she is sort of a veteran game designer um, and has sort of come into this, really cool space of building this highly complex narrative RPG. It's got like 600,000 words and you play as uh, 
this 12 year old girl who sort of lands on a planet with um, her community and her family and you play every year of her life um, while collecting um, sort of cards that include skills and memories and that's sort of how you progress a lot of the narrative forward um, you can die and as you it, when you die, you will actually like wormhole back to the beginning and start your life over again to go from age 12 to 19 to see if you can make it to the end. There's lots of romance and learning and sort of parental relationships that are fraught with like both really positive moments and really like moments that you would struggle with when you're a teenage kid, especially on an exoplanet. Um, and yeah, we've been, um, the game is actually basically done. Um, we're sort of like very much at the tail end of development. So it will be launched this year. Um, on for sure PC and Mac and other platforms uh, will be announced later. And now, as we mentioned at the top, Tunic already available, what platforms? Yes, uh, so Tunic came out, yeah, like I mentioned, about five and a half weeks ago. Um, it's on PC and Mac, and there are five storefronts you can find it at, which is Steam, GOG, Itch.io, Epic, and Humble. I was like, oh my gosh, I missed one. Um, and it's also on Xbox, it was a console launch exclusive, so um, it works on XV1, uh, through the X Series X, um, and we were a shadow drop for Game Pass. So it was a day one launch on Game Pass. Fantastic. One last question for you. Co-founder and CEO of Finji, as I mentioned at the top, the company has a lot of games over the years that have been published and developed. From your perspective, what's it been like to see so many titles go through development and publication at your company? And how do you feel the industry has changed, maybe from an independent publisher's perspective, throughout the years. Oh my gosh, I could probably talk about this for hours. Um, so yeah, we started back, we started game development back in like the flash days. So my husband and co-founder um, made Cannibal, which is sort of one of the original Endless Runners. Um, and we sort of moved through the iOS space and then, well, first flash space, then iOS space. And now we are a console and PC developer. Um, for us, like, I don't know, like what's, what's changed? Not much. Um, sort of people always look at the games industry and they only see like a very narrow slice of it. But when you've been around for like 15 years, you can see that this, the industry sort of works in cycles where like uh, new hardware comes out, lots of new types of games comes out. And then like sort of the industry will like shrink and tighten up again. And then it will like, like new hardware will come out or a new platform will come out. And like the same thing will happen where like the budgets for games and for new experimental stuff will sort of like increase again and all of these all of these sort of like boom cycles are when you see a lot of the really cool like sort of like really aggressive push pushes forward in the types of games that people are playing um one of the best examples i can always come up with is like when the switch came out um we were still like in like aggressive console wars uh nindo or nintendo was for uh babies and children and like the switch came out and all of a sudden people are like oh my god everyone should have this and the marketplace for the Switch sort of opened up the types of games that were available. And the sort of push forward on the types of games that people are playing, but also the people who got to play games and found a place and a home for games, meant the market continued to expand. It meant that more games could be made. Like, in the 15 years that like I've been doing this, like that's the coolest thing about this, is like what was available to us 15 years ago probably didn't include me like uh, at that point, like a 26 year old, like woman, like now I'm in my forties and like, I can see that there are games being made every year that like I desperately want to play. They're not ignoring me anymore, which is like super cool. And like, it's a valid form of expression in our medium and like that should exist. I agree completely. Fantastic insight. And, and it's true. You, uh, it's been amazing to see that evolution in the marketplace over time. Do have to leave it there. Becca, co-founder and CEO of Finji, thank you so much for your time. And keep it here to Hippocritic for more from PAX East all weekend long. Thanks for watching. For more content from the Hippocritic crew, hit that subscribe button or visit us at hypocritic.gg.